today's speaker is uh, David Langerfeld. Many people in Tupelo know him, uh, and uh, he's actually in my office building. So if he has technical difficulties, I'm going to run back there and help him. Uh, but I wanted you to be able to hear him well. Um, he's originally from Starkville. He's married to Martha Harrison Langerfeld, one of my closest friends. Uh, she was a preschool director for a long time at First Baptist. And, she was able to retire when they married and started going on travel journeys with him as well. Uh, he's a Mississippi State graduate, so those of you that are Bulldogs can appreciate that. Um, he also has a master's from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, and as I said, he was he, he retired from Harrisburg after 27 years of service there. Um, he's been at multiple churches elsewhere. Um, he's, he's a big sports fan. Um, but the main thing he does is take trips and travel um, in Israel and Middle East and Greece. Uh, I started kind of with, I think, where it all began. He'll tell you more. But he did an archaeological dig in 1983 in Jordan uh, and kind of started the historical study of all that whole area in the Holy Land. Has done 16 pilgrimages to Israel uh, and made 18 trips. He's also done Paul's journeys in Greece. Uh, and, and that's the one I have not been on yet. I've been with them to the Holy Land, but I haven't done uh, Greece. And so I'm excited to hear what he has to say about that as well. Um, he leads Bible studies. He's done, uh, he's helped with the Southern Baptist Convention, Canadian Convention uh, leader. Uh, he's preached at multiple retreats. Uh, let's, let, he can sing, by the way. He does a fantastic Via Dolorosa <laughs> rendition, if you want to hear it. Um, he's done mission, uh, dental missions. Uh, but ultimately, he really doesn't need a lot of introduction that Amanda Angle can provide. Uh, David is clearly the one that you need to hear from. So let me go. Do you know how to unmute yourself, David? Uh, should be on that screen at the bottom left. You got it. Does that got me? You got yeah. it. And then you can go ahead and start sharing your screen like we worked on, and I'll head your way to help you if I need to. All right. Are y'all able to see the the slideshow? Not yet. You'll need to share your screen at the bottom. Click share screen should be yep. there. And then pick that one and then click share. All right, and I'll move that back over here. Now we can see it. Thank you. Right. Okay. You good? Yeah, we'll just we'll just work from here. Um, I can't see me, but hopefully you can see the screen. So, um, yeah, I, I, one of my favorite things to do is to take people to Israel and to be able to enjoy uh, walking where Jesus walked, uh, seeing the things of uh, 4,000, 6,000 years worth of history uh, right before your eyes. Uh, but just to hear and sense and smell the same things that uh, the earliest Christians saw and smelled and thought and heard. So today I want to start uh, and, and just instead of just doing slides and saying, okay, here's a slide of this, here's a slide of this, I would much rather you uh, be able to see some PowerPoint slides. And so that's what I'm going to try to see if this will work for us. Uh, so we're going to start with some lessons from Israel and start off with a little fun. The first one is um, be careful when feeding the camels. Uh, there are camels all over Israel, as you can imagine. Uh, they are everywhere. Camels are actually expensive. Uh, people will talk about Joseph and Mary riding a donkey. They probably didn't just because a donkey would have cost the equivalent of about $4,000. Uh, donkeys were expensive and camels were expensive. Uh, and now they are one of the main staples that are uh, in Israel. Uh, these are some of the folks that you may recognize that have gone on trips with me with Jeremy and Catherine McMahon. Um, some of you know Ricky. Ricky's the one with the red shirt in case you're not sure. Um, and just a uh, camel ride is something that everybody needs to do. It's kind of like, hey, we go to Israel, go to the Middle East, got to ride the camel. So brought some shots to some folks you may know, Josh West uh, with Delta Blues. Uh, and he got into the, really got into it when he rode the camel. He wanted to look uh, the part. And his wife, Jill Waycaster, also riding with him. And so, again, this is just some pictures of the camel. I just want to start off with a little bit of fun. Now, my wife is going to shoot me for showing these, but uh, this is her first camel ride. This is my wife, Martha, and um, she's preparing for a fun ride. But as you tell, it quickly turned into something that uh, a little bit more than she thought. And the expressions on her face are kind of a giveaway. 
like I said, she's going to shoot me for showing these and y'all protect me. Um, but it is something that everybody needs to do at least once and uh, uh, have fun with. And it makes a great shot at the end of a, a journey. But one of the things you can do is to feed the camels. And the way you do that is you'll put a piece of fruit in your mouth and lean over just slightly toward the camel and the camel will pull it out of your mouth. This is Linda Hale um, feeding the, the camel. As you can see, she lets go like you're supposed to. And Nancy Lee McDade doing the same feeding the camel. The problem was when Leah Belk Thomason, this is Leroy Belk's daughter, she leaned over just a little bit too far and got a face full of camel. So I love to show this slide and, and just have fun with it. So that's, that's our fun introduction, but now we'll get serious and talk about lessons from Israel. When I worked on archeological dig in 1983, we were working about a half a mile east of the Dead Sea near Machiris. Machiris is where John the Baptist was beheaded. Uh, one of Herod, Herod's outposts uh, was actually in Jordan as opposed to Israel. And the scripture that came alive to me was this scripture, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Now this is the uh, oil lamp. It's very typical in which you would put olive oil in the center. You would have a waxed string that would come out and you would like that. The problem is, is when we think of uh, things from scripture, we tend to think of them from our American point of view. We see them as things that are, uh, would make sense to us. So when we hear thy word is a lamp unto my feet, we tend to think of a old fashioned lamp with an oil base and a chimney that would light up the entire room. But if you look at this small, small oil lamp, you'll realize quickly that if you put this in the palm of your hand, how far could you see? Probably just a couple of feet. Um, maybe in front of you. So when the word says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, folks, what God is talking about is just the next step. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I want the halogen head beam. I want to be able to see 200 yards down the road at night. I want to see everything uh, clearly, but that's not what God promised. He said, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. You'll be able to see your next footstep or your next footsteps. And so just want to encourage you as we look at these lessons to remember that everything in the, the scripture, we need to see it just as they saw it from the eyes of those who wrote it. The second lesson is man's glory fades, but God's glory lasts. So let me take you into a couple of the sites in Israel. The first is into the desert. Uh, this is what the desert looks like. And when we think of desert, we tend to think Sahara and sand. But when you talk about wilderness and desert, it's mostly rock and dirt. Uh, it's a little bit different than what we anticipate because we think of the word desert having to do with sandy places. In the middle of that is uh, a place called Masada. It's an incredible uh, place that Herod built. Masada is to the Israelites and to the Hebrews and to the Jews of this day. It is much like um, Pearl Harbor is to us. When we say, remember Pearl Harbor, it stirs up the uh, patriotic emotion. When a soldier goes to Masada, and this is the mountain of Masada, he receives his rifle, and this is where he stands and says, Masada shall never fall again. Now here's an aerial view of the top of Masada, of the remains uh, that were left from Herod. Herod built this incredible fortress at the top of a mountain. Uh, the, the way you can reach it now is you can walk it, which is pretty tough, um, or we catch the cable car, and that's what most people do. Just to show you that uh, on this um, screen, you'll see that at the bottom, there's kind of just right of center, there's a square. That's the old Roman encampment that's left. Some of the old walls that are left there from Mas Sylvanus tried to capture Masada. Here at the top of Masada, you can see the Dead Sea in the background and our folks that are walking up to the very top. And here, this huge fortress that he built. It's an amazing place, it's an amazing complex. Herod built enough places to store food and water for 10,000 soldiers for five years. 10,000 soldiers could stay at the top of Masada for five years and never have to worry about leaving the mountain. Uh, these are some of the storehouses that you see here where they've stored grain and uh, food and olive and uh, everything that you can imagine that you would need to eat. Uh, here's one that's set up. They put a, a modern M4, but they put it there to show you the size of these, and this is where this is one of the storage rooms where they stored olive oil. 
it's an amazing place. Uh, you, these are the different things that have been built by here, the different uh, captain's quarters that you see located here, a large bathhouse that Herod created. And here's the bath. Uh, it was a beautiful room. You can see the gesso painting still on the wall. Um, and Herod had a way of channeling water to the very top of the mountain. Uh, just some of the remains that you see there. And I want to take you from his bathhouse into the sauna room. At the top of this mountain, in the middle of the desert, in the middle of uh, the wilderness, he has this beautiful uh, edifice built there. And it's uh, underneath, you see the pylons and the water would run under there. The steam would rise out of the vent. And he had a double purpose. He actually had the kitchen on the other side. And the kitchen would, uh, they would use the heat from the water from the steam to cook with. And at the same time, they would uh, use it for bathhouse and for other things. Just absolutely amazing. Not only that, his palace actually hung over the side of the mountain. Now this is a model of it, and you can see it's a three-tiered palace, the one below, the round one in the middle, and the one at the top. Now these are the remains that you can see today, uh, and to give you an idea of just how, I mean, you're sitting up on the side of a mountain, and this engineering marble with this palace hanging over the edge of the cliff. Here's some of the other remains, and again, you see the Roman encampment down at the very bottom. And just to give you an idea of how high up you are in the size, if you look at this picture, you'll see the ramparts that you can access. You'll see people standing out in the middle of the picture uh, on the platform, which is where the second tier was. Uh, so the, the third tier was above it, the lower tier on the bottom. And here is this incredible engineering marvel. Uh, people still don't know to this day how he accomplished some of the things that he did. Again, showing you just some of the things that are there. Masada is a marvelous place, and I could spend an hour or two just taking you through Masada, but I want to leave you with one picture and let you guess what these are. Uh, if you look at them, you might, well, what in the world are those? Those are actually rolling stones and catapult balls. They would keep these at the top of the mountain, and whenever somebody tried to breach the mountain or come up the mountain, they would line them up across the top and just roll them down. And of course, there's no place for you to hide. Uh, and soldiers would be killed trying to access it. They would also load these into catapults and launch them over the side. So this is one of Herod's big building uh, areas, Masada. He had four fortresses. He had Masada in the south to protect it from Cleopatra. He had Jericho in the east to protect him from Sheba. He had Caesarea Maritima on the western coast to protect him. And then right outside of Bethlehem, he had a place called Herodium. From there, I want to take you to Caesarea Maritima. This was his place on the western coast. Uh, again, I want to show you what an incredible builder Herod was. You've heard about Herod all your life as the one that killed little babies uh, in Bethlehem at the time Jesus was born. But this is, uh, this is just some incredible, incredible building projects that he took on. This was the ancient city of Caesarea. It was the only seaport on the Mediterranean on the eastern side. It was larger than Piraeus at Athens. It was larger than Rome's port. Um, it was a 300 yard breakwater that went out into the ocean. Um, and triunes and other uh, Roman and Greek ships would come in, Phoenician ships to the harbor. And, uh, and the, the waves were so rough, but when he created this harbor, uh, the rough waves would actually be calmed into this uh, port that he built. Here's another picture of how it looked in ancient times. It was the largest seaport in the world at that time. So this is some of the remains of Caesarea Maritima. And you might say, well, have I ever heard of it? I know you've heard of Caesarea Philippi. That's mentioned, this is where Christ asked the disciples, whom do you think that I am? And he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. But Caesarea Maritima uh, is talked about in almost every chapter of the book of Acts after chapter 10. In fact, the first Gentile convert, one of the Lord, Cornelius, was the uh, officer of the 9th Italian Regiment, and uh, he was stationed in Caesarea, and while he was praying, uh, God revealed to him, and then Peter came and shared with him, and this man was saved at, at Caesarea Maritima. So this was this incredible port. These are some of the Roman statues that are there. Those of you that are familiar know the answer, but if you're wondering why do they not have any heads, um, the Romans, after a while, got tired of building statues every time a new a uh, Roman emperor would come into place. So they would actually just switch heads. That's not a joke. They would actually take the, the head of the former emperor, put the new head on it, same body. 
But these were huge statues that uh, stood all around this ancient theater. And again, just to show you a little bit of the theater, it's an engineering marvel. If you stand down at the bottom of the theater and somebody is on that top stair, even if you're talking in a normal voice and not shouting, they can hear exactly everything that you say. And again, just some shots to give you an idea of this beautiful area. This is the governor's chair, uh, not the white plastic one that's sitting there from today, but this is where the governor sat. This is where Paul would have stood before Felix and Agrippa and Herod and uh, many different Roman emperors that were stationed there. The lower palace Herod built for himself. And again, it was an engineering marvel that, that hung out over the water. These are the remains that you'll see today. Again, this is Caesarea Maritima, one of Herod's major uh, building projects. It's situated on the Mediterranean. Uh, not, if you literally start where the Mediterranean curves at the top and at the bottom, it's just about halfway on the right-hand side. This is the remains of the ancient port, and you can see the water is breaking in, and then you would have the harbor. But something's fascinating here. On the right side of this is a hippodrome. When you see movies like Ben-Hur, this is where they took place, uh, the, the chariot races. Now, most people will assume that the chariot races took place in the Colosseum in Rome. They didn't. They took place at the Circus Maximus, uh, which is below the Colosseum. Uh, and it's a hippodrome raceway, very similar to this one. And you can see this is uh, at, uh, some of the beautiful remains that are there. And take you from there to the aqueducts. Herod built a series of aqueducts, and again, another engineering marvel, uh, 13 miles, and the water drops one inch every mile, drops 13 inches over 13 miles. Absolutely incredible. I took Jerry um, uh, Keaton with me one time, a soil water conservation engineer. He said, I don't know how in the world they did that. He said, even with modern implements, it would have been hard to do, but understanding they only had plumb bobs and chisels, um, so the channel, uh, it goes all the, 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 the aqueducts themselves go from Caesarea back up to Mount Hermon. They would take the, the snow and, and uh, get the, the water, excuse me, no, I said Mount Hermon, um, Mount Carmel. They would bring the water in from Mount Carmel. There were two channels, one fed the upper part of the city, one fed the lower part of the city. So that's just two of Herod's building projects. And there's a reason I'm talking about all these and I'll come to in just a second. One that you can't see today was the second temple. This was Herod's temple, and this is what it looked like. Uh, when Jesus would have worshipped the temple, this is what the temple looked like. Uh, the temple itself is gone. All we have left today is the temple mound area, which is very famous. If you turn on the news, you see something about it just about every night, and the western wall, or the wailing wall. There's where the temple stood. To the right is the Mount of Olives. The red part on the bottom of the, of the temple mound area is called the Royal Stoa. And down below it, you have the holy gates. This is the way that people would walk up into the temple. Now on the side that's on the, the western side, that's the western wall. <clears throat> and from about that middle gate, all the way over to the end uh, of the western side, that's the western wall that you see, or the wailing wall that you see on the news every night from Jerusalem. Now to give you an idea of the size, on the northwest corner, you see a structure. That's the Fortress Antonia. So imagine, that's where Jesus was held and captured where Pilate lived. Imagine a Roman fortress, and then look at the rest of this. Uh, this thing took up a fourth of ancient Jerusalem. It was huge. It was incredible. And people used to talk about how Herod was a, in just an incredible builder. And so let me show you some of the remains today. This is the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall. You, the bottom bricks are from uh, Herod's time. The middle bricks are later Roman added and then uh, some crusader bricks on the very top. But just to show you the size, the enormity, uh, all of these bricks that are inlaid, just like the pyramids use these same types of bricks. In fact, some of these stones are exactly the same time size as the pyramid stones. But now I wanna take you beneath this. When you see this, you're seeing 80% of this wall, the Wailing Wall. Beneath it is another 20%. There are four stones beneath this wall. This is in the Western Wall Tunnel. This is down below, 20 feet below where you just were. There is one stone here. It is nine feet high, 11 feet wide, 
and it is 40 feet long. It weighs over 600 tons. Now stones in the pyramid weigh 200 tons, just to give you an idea. This one weighs 600 tons. It sits at the top of the mountain, Mount Moriah, where Abraham was to have sacrificed Isaac. And this stone is in place. I'll show you a couple of other pictures. That's, even though there's carvings on it, and there's all, that's all one stone all the way down. And again, showing you the other direction. And to give you an idea of the mass here, I am standing in front of it, uh, showing this, the drawing. And then here's another picture. Incredible. Now I'm showing you all this because most people when we go to Israel for the first time, never realized what an incredible builder that Herod was. And they talk about, well, this is marvelous. Caesarea, Masada, the second temple, and their Herodian, all the things they see that Herod built. And then I asked the question. I said, okay, how many of you remember Herod being a great builder? And most people respond, well, we don't. I said, how many of you remember that Herod had these incredible stones, one that weighs 600 tons, put in a place that people have no idea how he got it there? People say, we, we don't have any idea. Then I asked, how many people remember a little boy that went to the brook of Elah and picked up five smooth stones and met a giant? And of course, everybody said, well, sure, everybody knows about David and Goliath. Why is that the case? Well, my second lesson is just to remind you, Herod did, did everything for Herod's glory. He built everything for his own glory. He built everything so he would be remembered. David did it for God's glory. And it's just a reminder today that if we build things for ourselves, it will quickly fade. But if we build things for God and for his kingdom and do things for him and to serve him, it will last. Man's glory fades, but God's glory lasts. One of the things I learned on the dig when I worked there is we worked with a Bedouin. We would, we would eat with the tent with these nomadic people. And I love this lesson that I learned because I've read Psalm 23 all my life. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. You know, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. And it says, thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. The first time we ate with the Bedouins, I learned something. I learned, first of all, they were great guests and great hosts. They would give you the food, even if they were broke and didn't have any food left, they would tell you that they had already eaten and they would give you their food. They would put you before them. But they had a, a, a very uh, interesting thing that they did, and here's what it was. They would pour your drink and you would drink uh, the drink during the meal. And anytime it got about half full, three fourths full, they would come back and refill it. And throughout the night as you ate with them or throughout the, the day, if you were eating lunch with them, they would keep refilling your cup. Now, when it was time for you to go, they just didn't fill your cup anymore. You would keep drinking, nobody. And so you knew the time had come. Now, they weren't being mean. <laughs> they weren't trying to run you off. That was just their way, much as you might say to your friends, well, you know, uh, we've got to get up early tomorrow morning. It's probably time for us to call it a night. They didn't say that. They just didn't refill the cup. So what an incredible thing it is to know that David says, my cup runneth over. God wants you to constantly, wants you to know that he will constantly refill your cup over and over and over again. He wants you to sit at his banquet table. He wants you to eat his food. He wants you to enjoy his presence and he will never, ever leave you nor forsake you. So anytime that you're feeling alone, just look at that cup at your table and, and even if it's empty, be reminded that God says, my cup runneth over. And he will always, 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 continuously, over and over again, refill your cup with his presence and his power and his love. The fourth lesson I want to lead you to is about the weight. Uh, this is Capernaum. Capernaum was one of Jesus' um, three cities that he did most of his mighty works. Now, people tend to think that was Jerusalem. So let me just give you a quick reminder. Where was Jesus born? Bethlehem, right. Where was he reared? Nazareth, correct. Where was he crucified, buried, resurrected? Jerusalem, right. But where did he do his ministry? 
actually was in and around the Sea of Galilee. He only went to Jerusalem three times a year for the three feasts at Passover and Shavuot, and then uh, he would go for um, Sukkot in the fall. So most of his ministry was actually done in and around the Sea of Galilee at Capernaum, at Bethsaida, and at Chorazin. He mentions this in scripture when it says, then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. What do you Chorazin? What do you Bethsaida? For if the miracles had been performed and you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it'd be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed and you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. Imagine Jesus lived in Capernaum, but condemned it and said it was going to be worse than even Sodom and Gomorrah. But I tell you, it'll be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. So here we are at Capernaum. Jesus left Nazareth when, and moved to Capernaum, and that became his hometown. There's a lot of interesting things there. There's millstones and ancient weight stones. Uh, things used for agriculture, things used, it was a fishing village. There's a synagogue there, and there has two levels. The black level is that it comes at the time of Jesus. That's basalt stone, like you would find near a volcanic uh, stone. And then the white level was built with limestone, was built just after the time of Jesus. So when you go there today, uh, you can't actually access the lower level except just to touch that edge there because the white level is on top, but you're still walking on top of the synagogue where Jesus preached and taught so much of the time during his ministry. And just some other pictures to show you this. Uh, it's a beautiful little synagogue that's located there. This is where the, the rabbi would have taught the disciples. And then this is the town, the Capernaum of what's left and all the remains that are there. And you see the synagogue in, in the top of the picture. And then looking out over the city toward the Sea of Galilee, and again, some of the remains, that black basalt was what they used to build during the time of Christ. And Peter's house is also located here. If you remember, uh, Jesus left the synagogue and went and healed Peter's mother at his house. And these are the remains of Peter's house. Capernaum is a beautiful little city now. These are some of the remains. You see the Ark of the Covenant remains, uh, not itself, but a picture of it on some limestone. These are uh, Roman mosaics. They're also Roman mile markers. Um, Capernaum was the first weight station, the first tax station on the, what's called the Via Maris or the Way of the Sea. This is the way the Romans would leave Damascus, which was the major trade city of ancient times. They would come down the Via Maris and cross over to the sea and ship out of Caesarea Maritima that you saw earlier. But the thing that's interesting is there uh, that you don't see many other places because most of them have disappeared is these incredible millstones. And this is what they look like. Now, to tell you a little bit about it, that stone at the top is called a millet. The, the basin at the bottom is called a yam. And what you would do is you would put grapes ready to be processed, excuse me, not grapes, I'm sorry, olives, I, I apologize. You would put olives ready to be processed. You would put them in, you would roll that millet around and they would pop those olives. And once they had been popped, they would be put into um, a bag that was kind of like a, bra uh, a burlap sack. It had a weave to it that would allow the pulp to stay in the bag, but would allow the juice to come out of the olives. And so over here, beside this yam in the millet, this millstone, we have what's called an olive press. It's just a huge piece of stone. And if you look carefully, you'll see that at the base of that stone, there's a basin and there's a little channel, a little sieve that runs down into it. What they would do is the men would take this stone. It took four men to lift it. They would put it on top of one of these bags. It would crush and squeeze the olive oil out of the olives and then it would go into that basin. And that's the way they processed olives in ancient times. To give you a little bit closer picture, there is that same basin, but now I want to tell you something. It's called a get shimon, which means olive press, and it's where we get the word Gethsemane. Now, as you remember, the last night of Jesus' life before, while he was free, before he went into captivity in the uh, Caiaphas' house in the Roman prison, 
Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that night, you remember, he fell face forward and he cried. And as he prayed and he cried out to the Lord, his sweat became drops of blood. His sweat was so intense. And so every time I see one of these, I'm just reminded what an incredible image that there in the Garden of Gethsemane would have been an olive press, something to squeeze the olive out of the olives, excuse me, squeeze the olive oil out of the olives. And there next to something that was made to squeeze, that weight that was made to squeeze the olive oil out of the olives, the weight of the world, your sin and my sin, squeezed the blood out of Jesus. What an image. The weight of the olive was made to squeeze olive out of the olive oil. Or excuse me, I keep saying that, squeeze the olive, olive oil out of the olives. And yet at that same time, Jesus Christ suffered the weight of the world, your sin and our sin, on his shoulders, waiting for the crucifixion. My time is going short. Uh, let me give you one more, and I guess I'll just have to end with this one because my 30 minutes is about gone. I have so many. Uh, she might let me come back sometime. I would love to share. Chorazin is one of my favorite places to go in Israel. Most groups don't go there because there's not enough time, but we had an extra day under our trip to make sure that we go. And here's an aerial view of Chorazin and what it looks like. These are the remains from ancient times. Although the remains date to first and second century, the roads that you see our people walking on, those roads date to the time of Christ. So people ask me, can you actually walk where Jesus walked? Absolutely, and this is one of those places because you're walking exactly at the same street, same street level, um, same rocks, everything that existed 2,000 years ago. There you see the remains of the ancient city. Uh, just some of the houses will take you through. This is the temple that's there. And uh, this is what a typical temple looked like. And these are the remains of the temple today. And um, as you see it along the side, there's some beautifully decorated columns and posts uh, that remain even to this day. Uh, this again, this is along the side where the rabbi would have taught the disciples. There's a Moses seat there, the only one that was ever found in all of Israel. It was mentioned in scripture in Matthew 23, verses 2 and 3. Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you sit in the seat of Moses, and yet you do not practice what you're supposed to do. And so, what was Moses' seat? Well, since Moses had written the Torah, those first five books of the Old Testament, if you were to stand, if you were to read from the scripture, you would stand. So you would stand up to read the scripture, but you would sit in the seat of Moses to teach. Now, um, most of you are familiar with this. Maybe you've gone to church and the pastor has said, let's stand to honor the reading of God's word. This comes straight out of that Jewish tradition of standing to read the word. But once you would teach, you would sit down because you were not as good as Moses, quote unquote. And so therefore you would sit in the seat of Moses to teach. It's interesting when you read the scripture, go back and read sometimes how many it says, and Jesus sat and taught them saying, we tend to think of Jesus always standing and walking around in the crowds, but quite often it said he would, Jesus sat and taught them saying, so you stand to read God's word. You would sit in the seat of Moses to teach God's word. Again, some of the remains, uh, the beautiful little town that's left there. And we know that Jesus did most of his mighty works there. And this is a typical home. You're standing in the courtyard. That's a storage bin area in front of you that looks like little lockers. And then that's the oven area behind you. That's where they would have cooked. But what I want to conclude with today is to show you on the, uh, the side are these added on rooms. Where did they come from? Well, they're called an insula. And there's one and another, and another. Why is this important? When a husband and wife were in their premarital state, the, the father of the groom and the father of the bride would arrange for the marriage. They were, didn't date. Uh, this was just typical of ancient times that all the marriages were prearranged. And after the father groom and the father bride would arrange a bride price, then the father of the groom would take a pitcher and take it over to his son, a pitcher like you put water in, not a pitcher you hang on the wall, but he would take a pitcher with some juice in it and he would take it over to the son and he would hand it to his son and he would pour some in a chalice. 
and the son would drink a little bit and then he would walk over to his potential bride and he would hold the chalice out in front of her and he would say these words or something very similar all that i am and all that i have i give to you i give all of myself to you and the girl would either drink from the the chalice and not say anything or she would drink from the chalice and she would say I accept all that you are and all that you have and all that you have to give. And I give all of myself to you. And that was the beginning of the marriage. Well, what would happen? Well, then the son would go back with his father and he would go to his house and he would need to build on a room. And here's another insula. And it's just like we get the word peninsula where you add it's something added on or it's a little island added on. This was an insula. It was a room that was added on. Why am I sharing this? I love this because in John 14, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many, and the word there we translate mansions is the word insula. There are many great rooms. They've been added on. Now, my mother loves to hear me sing, I've got a mansion over the hilltop, and it's a beautiful song, but that's not what the scripture says. It says, in my father's house are many insula, many great rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go now to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am now, there you may be also. What an incredible image Jesus was using to share with the disciples and the people that were gathered. Everybody would have understood this metaphor that he was using. He was saying, look, I'm going away. I'm going back to my father's house. And one day my father's gonna look and he's gonna look at all these rooms that I've been preparing and he's gonna say, son, go get your bride. And Jesus is gonna return and we're gonna live with him for eternity. And so if you have somebody in your life, you've lost a loved one, a spouse, a child, a parent, a friend, I just wanna encourage you to remember this promise today. Jesus said, I've gone away to prepare a place for them and if I go, I will come again and I'm going to receive them unto myself that where I am now, there you may be also. And Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How are we going to know the way? And he said, look, I'm the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the father, but by me. In my father's house are many insula. Well, my time is up. Thank you for letting me share. I have so many, maybe I'll get a chance to come back and share some more. I love to talk about this. Thank you for your listening. All right, well, thank you, David. We're going to open it up for questions. Hey, David, is Israel closed for visitors at this time? Right now, some of the, the Israel itself is not closed. You can fly in, but a lot of the sites are closed. We actually were going to be there October the 3rd through the 17th of this year. Uh, of course, we had to cancel our trip, but we've rescheduled you for next year during the same time. And if any of you want to go, I'll be glad to have you. Uh, you can contact me and I'll give you the information. But yes, the, the, the borders are open but limited and if you come from a red country like Greece and several of the European countries are right now you cannot enter you can enter but you can't visit most of the sites hey David this is David Sparks how many times have you been to the Holy Land well I've taken uh, I've been there 18 times I've taken 15 groups uh, my first trip was an archaeological dig uh, then I went back and uh, I I'm sorry, I get too, too excited talking about this. I mean, it's, it's just a, it's to walk and talk. Uh, Amanda's been with me and maybe she can say something, but it's just so incredible because so many things that you think of when I see Jordan River, I think of the Mississippi. The problem is the Jordan River is a small, small river. Uh, you can get across it uh, easily, except during flood stage. And so, so many things that you see that really help your knowledge of the scripture just come alive. Tell us about when your next one is. When's Greece? Yeah, uh, the next trip we're doing, we have we had to reschedule Greece too. Greece is a, uh, uh, if we go on a journeys of Paul, it's five days on the mainland going to Thessaloniki, to Athens, to Delphi, to Berea, to all the cities that you're, Corinth that you're familiar with. Then we do a five day cruise, that, uh, excuse me, a four day, three night cruise, five days on land, four day, three night cruise, and that goes to Patmos where John wrote Revelation, goes to Ephesus in Western Turkey, and we're gonna spend two days in Istanbul. 
And that is, and that will be in April, May of this coming year, 2021. All right, any more questions? All right, well, David, thank you so much. That was fascinating. We'd love to have you back again. Amanda, great speaker. Thank you very much. Um,